overlay that's going to transfer that or add something to the table, I'm not going to I'm not going <coughs> to just gratuitously shoot it. Carson. I do think that this is a, a very distinctive genre of journalism. One of the myriad popular myths about newsrooms is people think that reporters sit around and say, let's come up with a story that's going to get Charlie Baker elected. Let's come up with a story that's going to get Deval Patrick elected. In truth, reporters are interested in great stories at core. Nothing more, nothing less. I've never heard in my eight years at the Globe or my 16 at the Miami Herald people rubbing their hands together and saying, let's do a story that will get this person elected or that will cause the stock market to go up or down. Covering something like this, though, is a very different experience. And it really, I think, was revealed to me in covering Hurricane Katrina when several days after the hurricane, I found myself along with Dina standing in the airport in which it was a tableau of thousands of people, the, really the broken people of New Orleans who had been abandoned there. And I remember seeing one woman who was dying before our eyes and who very much, I thought, was like my own mom who had died a year and a half before. But I was there when she died. This woman was there alone. And I think it was at that moment, and certainly in covering this earthquake, when I realized that the only way to do it effectively was that when you saw a young man like the one we chronicled, who was having a finger amputated, that the very human response was, in fact, to tear up that in all the trauma there, you might say, well, he was losing a finger. So many lost so much more. And yet, there was something so poignant and moving to me that he came in there with a certain part of himself, and he was leaving, at least physically, somewhat diminished. And if that doesn't move you, I think that you can't report on it effectively, that you can't complete your mission. And so in that way, this is a very distinctive form of journalism. I, you know, I, I like some, uh, one doctor, um, I think, said it really well. You know, she, she said that um, it was a lot harder, she thought, for people to be here than it was for us to be, or for them to be there. And I, I felt the same way, you know, um, it was really the most horrific uh, scene I'd ever seen, but um, I just, you felt such a sense of purpose on the ground and that you had to keep going. And people who were talking to you weren't crying, and they'd been through this horrific trauma, you know, when, you know, I was not helpful to them, you know, if they were, you know, crying or not, you know, keeping it together as best I could. So I think, um, I don't know, I, I think just the sense of purpose on the ground with, is what um, makes you able to do it. So, um we we'll take a few more questions, then we wanted to show it. one more video. Oh, um, okay, all right. Uh, let's just take this one question here, and yeah. then we'll do that. I'm curious about, when you talk about chronicling something like this, and that it takes so much out of you, um, what is it about this experience that fuels you? And I think you just addressed that somewhat. And when you get back after one of these horrific trips, or diff difficult, what do you need to do to take care of yourself? And how ready are you to go out again? When does that happen? And do you want to go out on the same story? Or do you want to just put that on the shelf and go do another story? I'm curious about how this affects you in your lives. And what keeps you going? What keeps you, what keeps you responding to the request to go out and cover these things? i just give, give you another quick anecdote. I came back um, and the Globe was great. They actually had to, if you, if you guys need help or some counseling or, or mental health issues, just want to talk to someone we have contact, why don't you take some time off? And generally speaking, that's a good thing. I remember early, early in my career coming back and my first response was to be very angry. Um, the first time I went to Haiti was in 86 during the coup. And it was a real eye opener and I came back and I felt very angry at people, even family members. 
that don't you get it? You know, don't you get how lucky we are? But I think over time and experience, you, you start to understand it for me, that they're, they're two different realities. Um, and, and it's not a bad thing that people are different, and it's not their fault. But for example, I came back, I had some time, we all had some time to take off. I took a day, but I was all revved up, and I had to get more pictures in, and I went out, and my first assignment back two days later was to go to Beacon Hill at a, for a $12 million townhouse that was just being renovated and being put on the market. <laughs> so I walked in and I was greeted with a, a cadre of young designers and, um, you know, very elegant, wealthy. These people had flipped the house. They bought it for eight and they thought they could make a couple million. And I walked in and I was looking around and a few of the hanger-ons came up to me and one of them said, what do you think? And I just looked at him. I said, you don't want to know what I think. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me horrified, and I think I actually said it. I said, I just came back from Haiti. And he looked at me like I just dropped in from the moon. And he walked away, and I said, I oh, shouldn't have lied. That, I mean, I, I didn't say it in a mean way, but I felt like something needed to be said. And, and, then, and that was my big kind of outburst coming back. <laughs> I think the reason we're going to show you guys this next video is because it's a good segue into Partners in Health. Is that correct? Right. And we, we have a guest from Partners in Health who's going to say something. So first we'll show the video. Um, so as I mentioned, Jim Smith, uh, our colleague here, the former uh, just terrific foreign editor who now covers the connective tissue between Boston and the rest of the world, had embarked on a story looking at the transformative effect that the earthquake was having on partners in health, which had certainly a significant footprint in Haiti before the earthquake, but was really taking a central role in the wake of the earthquake. And so Dina and I went to the headquarters of Partners in Health in Haiti, in Conch, in the central plateau, and there we witnessed really the remarkable transformation of a fairly small hospital into a facility that was taking, taking care of hundreds of patients, some of whom one gentleman I encountered had taken four different forms of conveyance to get there. Such was the, and is the reputation of Partners in Health that he left Port-au-Prince in a tap-tap, one of those crowded buses jitneys you may have seen, then waited for someone else who was driving along who would be willing to take him a few more miles. And so you had patients in the chapel there, you had patients in the school, and again, a facility that had fairly modest capacity by US standards anyway, was transformed really into a tertiary care facility overnight.
tell, I just told to myself that I know my sister, and I know that she she believed in God and, and helping people. She, I'm I'm sure that she'll be very happy to know that I'm still working and helping other people to stay alive. That's the reason why one of the reason why I stay here and continue to help. And the other reason is just when I'm working, I don't think about it. I don't know how, but I hope one day it will be better than, than now. And maybe get better than before, we never know. So? Um, and, and it showed my favorite 
Dr. Massey, who's um, been with us for over 20 years and is our OBGYN director of, of health services. And so, you know, we're also trying to take care of some of the, the orphans' needs and the vulnerable children's needs that, that was raised, that question that was raised, and dealing with the people. Also, you know, we've got an agriculture program where our, our agronomists in Haiti, our Haitian agronomists, thought immediately that we need to start growing more food for all the people that have come out to our site. So they planted corn immediately, quick growing corn, which being a farm girl, I didn't know that that even existed, but they actually harvested their first crop last week. Um, so that we can start feeding the additional you know, patients and people in the Central Plateau who've come out. Um, so we're, we've started some schools in some of the camps and I've got some other pictures of that. We opened the Children's Home with, of all organizations, Operation Blessing, which is Pat Robinson's group. Um, but it's remarkable the partnerships that you form on the ground even though you might not be friends in the States. Um, <laughs> And this just shows the, the folks that we've hired and that we're working on a lot of agricultural programs. And so our, really our medium and our long-term strategy is to continue to pro provide care out in the Central Plateau in the Artubanit where we were working, um, helping address some of the health problems, education problems, food, water issues that the hundreds of thousands of people who left Port-au-Prince um, are, are experiencing in the areas where we're working. But also we have started operations in Port-au-Prince. <coughs> Somewhat unwillingly, honestly, on behalf of the Haitian staff who know how long we're going to have to stay committed to working there, but we also feel like we can't pull out at this point. Um, and so these are uh, just uh, the clinics, the health clinics that we've set up in uh, the big camp, uh, one large camp of about 50,000 internally displaced people in Port-au-Prince. And these are all our Haitian staff who are just seeing patients just for, you know, blood pressure checks. But all, you know, your average, average things now, people are just coming in to get care. Vaccinations, we've got women's health clinics set up. And a lot of, you know, regular pharmacies, patients, everything's for free, of course. And um, just the, through these in, because the guy in the orange shirt is actually one of the Haitian leaders of one of the camps. They've actually really formed their own um, sort of governing structures within the camps, trying to negotiate with the NGOs that are working there, trying to, you know, do sanitation projects, get some housing assistance and that sort of thing. And it's actually really remarkable, as, as people were showing to the resilience, but the self-organizing. But I also want to show, so this is the a camp, um, our largest camp, Park Jean-Marie Vincent, where, where this is actually a success story, even though it's, it's um, covered with sheets still, but there's rock on the ground where there was dirt before. Um, and so we've actually been able to get the Department of Defense to get in there and get some rock into this camp, but the shelter situation is still hard. And these are from last week. Um, and so these people don't have tents, they don't have tarps. And I think the question that was asked, where's the money? I agree it's, it's, a, it's a long, convoluted story, but I do think it's one that we need to start following a little bit more closely because um, there are still hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who don't have housing and don't have sanitation. And in a lot of cases, um, I'll just flip through these, in a lot of cases, the initial assistance was, was, you know, we put a dumpster in, so they now have trash services. But no systems have been put in place to actually empty the dumpster. Um, or we put the latrines in place, but nobody's actually coming and cleaning out the latrines, so these are all unusable at this point in time. Um, but these are happier pictures, sorry. Um, this is a school that we've helped set up, and, and so we've got at least 800 kids who are getting some education continuing um, in, their, in their studies at the camps. Water is actually one of the success stories. There's actually better access to potable water at Port Prince today than there was before the earthquake um, because of all of the supplies that have come in and also the systems were fixed better than they were before. Um, and this is a little girl, I wanted to just um, raise it in, uh, <coughs> A contrast to what the doctor was saying about we can't do dressing changes, so we don't even know what to do with this patient. Well, we've been now sending, still we're still sending down teams of volunteers. We're trying to get Haitian Americans as as many as we can, so that they speak the language and can communicate with the with the patients. But we're still sending down, hope having teams of 10 or 15 people down there at a time to to do the night shift. And this is a little girl who had burns all over her face and and chest and back. Who, who this um, amazing nurse from New York was started doing dressing changes on and then taught the next core of volunteers who were coming in so she has a much, much better chance of not getting infected and, and, and moving on. So these are also just some hopeful pictures of, of um, people who had amputations um, being already fitted with prostheses and, 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 and starting to move around on their own. 
Um, we're partnering with some groups out in the Central Plateau to do that. And so there's hope, um, but there's still huge needs. And, and so we really, I implore everybody that we're talking to, um, first to thank you for all of your interest and thank you for the support that everybody's provided so far. What, not just, not to us, but honestly just to Haiti. But also that we, we really need to keep um, the nation's interest, even though we're going to have, you know, we're already having Haiti fatigue. But it's not just on the relief efforts that we need to continue the in interest and in the, in the focus, but to also really look at our, our history with Haiti and, and how uneven it's been and the fact that we need to have much better consistent foreign policy as a country and we also need to do a much better job of coordinating the aid that we're getting. And actually, I have some happier pictures here too. So these are um, 41, these are just a few kids who um, were in a ward at the General Hospital, had all have, almost all have physical and, and um, developmental difficulties, and so had all been abandoned. We're all sitting in one tiny dark room in the hospital, and this is the one, the Operation Blessing, that's helped us purchase and, and get these kids. Um, we've got full-time nursing care for them, they're getting classes, they're getting PT, and you can, it, these pictures were taken last week and I was down there two weeks ago, you can see the kids, you can see how much happier they are. It's, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. This is the big room, open air room that they're all sleeping in. So there's some really good, happy success stories and we're really pleased to be a part of it, but we need to have more of them in the long term. Um, so I'll just end there and I just want to say thank you very much for letting me talk to you. getting pretty close to the end here, um, and so it's time for us to give a wonderful round of applause for our